First it was torn to pieces, and now it's missing. Is there an evil force that doesn't want us to read a warning letter written by a woman who is likely the first to hear the tapes? I'm Sutton Blackhill, and this is a Walk in Darkness podcast. We're hunting for a book written by a demon, and you're coming with us. This is the Walk in Darkness podcast with Wally Fitch and Sutton Blackhill. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the world premiere of the Walk in Darkness podcast. My name is Wally Fitch. And before we get started here, I have to warn you that this show is guaranteed to contain some disturbing content. And we will likely talk about some things that interfere with common beliefs. Please understand it's not our goal to offend, but it's our goal to find the truth. That's what this whole investigation is about, is to find the truth. Now, as this is the world premiere, a few introductions are in order. Now, that voice you just heard in the intro belongs to Sutton Blackhill. Yes, that Sutton Blackhill. The woman who is the only person so far that we know of that has listened to both tapes completely. And uh, it was her Instagram account that really kind of pushed me in this, into this investigation. And not only is she the hostess of our little show, but she's agreed to be my partner on this investigation. Say hi, Sutton. Hi, everyone. So as for me, I've been investigating the paranormal and supernatural since I was about 15 I guess that puts it at, what, about 33 years now. Um, I've investigated the Red Room of the White House, Abbey Road Studios, the Amityville House, North Brother Island, the Black House, which you guys might know as the Church of Satan, and, you know, plenty more. The list goes on and on. I've been doing this for a while. Before we begin, I'm assuming you guys listened to the intro episode from last week, and if not, I highly encourage you to listen so you're up to speed on all the events that brought us to where we are today. So where are we today? Well, that's the question that keeps me up at night. So far, we have a, uh, a few things going on. First, we have the tapes and the woman that's on them, um, which seem to confirm the stories that are heard while on tour. Next, we have Sutton's story and her experience in the house and with the tapes. And we're going to be telling her story uh, in a couple weeks. Then we have what we're going to talk about tonight, and that's the warning letter which is written by what seems to be a relative of the woman that's on the tapes. Normally, I wouldn't make a big deal about something like this, except that this letter is clearly a warning, and someone or something doesn't want us to read it. Sutton found it torn up before she had a chance to read it. She had to tape it all back up before she knew what it said. And when I went to go retrieve the tapes, it was missing altogether. So... What does this letter say? Whomever finds this letter and tapes, no, I did not live in this house. My sister, her husband, son, and my mother occupied the premises. Though soon after she arrived, my mother died in her bed after a long illness. I find myself alone here now after a tragedy that I cannot bring myself to write about at this time, because it's still too fresh in my mind but I need to share what has happened to me while I've been here and warn you not to do what I've done. Yesterday, as I cleaned out the small guest room my mother stayed in, I came across these disturbing audio recordings. I saved her room for last. The rest of the house is in order, though the door to the basement is boarded up and locked, and I'm too afraid to search for a key to open it. The ghoulish things that happened down there deserve to be laid to rest and never be disturbed. I've not listened to all the tapes, for the first one disturbed me too much, and I warn you not to play it. I don't believe anything good will come from the recordings being released. As soon as I hit the play button, it felt like bugs were crawling under my skin. I could not stop scratching my arms and legs and soon found blood under my nails. Even after I stopped the machine, strange things happened. All the dogs in the neighborhood started howling. Then I came down with a migraine, which I haven't experienced in over 20 years. Though I wanted to leave this house, I was too ill to go anywhere. 
It is morning now, and I found myself at the kitchen table sitting for hours, terrified to stay, terrified to go, without doing the right thing. The recording is in my head, and no matter how hard I try to stop it, the noise of it keeps replaying. Every time I go to the trash to discard the tapes, my chest tightens, and I cannot breathe. The only thing I can think to do with what I found is to bury it. Once I have done this, I will leave and never come back. I pray I find peace as soon as my job is done here. Okay, so many questions pop up. First, who wrote the letter? And what can they tell us about the person on the tapes? What are those ghoulish things that happen in the basement? And what is the author's relationship with the person on the tape? So the first challenge was to find out who the person is that wrote the letter. And really, you know, there's nothing, virtually nothing to go on. And I began to wonder if this was even possible. So I started with finding out who owned the house. I contacted the Bonneville County Assessor's Office, and the record showed that a Frank and Madeline Harrington owned the house from 1961 until 1978. Now, knowing someone died during that time, I'm thinking right around 1969, I looked up obituaries during 1969 and 1972. I found an Agatha O'Toole who was survived by her daughters, Madeline Harrington and Patricia Donaldson. Patricia Donaldson was listed as the current owner beginning in 1978. So I started with her. I figured she was likely the one that wrote the letter. So I had an idea of who wrote the letter, but there was even a bigger challenge, finding the right Patricia Donaldson. Now, (laughs) there's over a thousand Patricia Donaldsons on Facebook Directory assistants had even more. So without knowing where she lived, I had to think of a, a, a different way to narrow all this down. So knowing that she owned that house on Elm Street and because Sutton moved in there at one point, I knew the house might be available to buy her rent. Um, at this time, I wasn't hooked up with Sutton, so she couldn't help me uh, with finding out the owner or getting in touch or anything like that. So I started calling real estate and property management companies around Idaho Falls, and eventually I got a hit. Now, they wouldn't release the names, you know, or contact information or anything like that, which I figured that would happen. Um, But I asked them if I could leave my information and have the owner contact me. Now, they seemed really, really hesitant, but they finally agreed. I can be persistent when I want to. Um, About a week later, I got a phone call from a frail sounding woman. She identified herself as Patricia Donaldson and that her property manager gave her a message to call me. I asked her if Madeline Harrington was her sister and she really kind of went quiet and hesitated and, you know, I kind of jumped in. I said, okay, look, I know about the tapes in the letter. I know, you know, about the house and stuff that seemed to calm her down a little bit, but also scare the hell out of her at the same time. So we got into the conversation. I said, you know what? I do a podcast. Can I record this to put on the podcast? Uh, After a little bit of coaxing, she agreed. But the problem is, and maybe these are the forces of evil going against us, the audio just didn't turn out. It was very low and crackly, and it just didn't turn out. So I couldn't use our conversation. So what I did was I had it transcribed and... Sutton is going to read Patricia's parts here so we can kind of uh, get a feel for what the conversation was like. I found the tape sent. Sorry, sorry, I'm going to start over. I found the tapes in the player in the corner of the closet, which were covered with years worth of dust. The label only had the date. Curious as to what was on them, I popped them into the player. I immediately got chills. I heard my mother. She was telling the story of her childhood, how she befriended a demon, or rather a demon befriended her. My aunts and uncles would always joke about her having an imaginary friend, and at first I thought the demon was just that. Imaginary, but... So, at this point, she kind of trailed off, and I heard her take a sip of something. Buying time, I could tell she was trying to debate whether or not to reveal something that she almost let slip. My mother had a gift. 
She wasn't the first in our family with this gift, but at that time it wasn't looked upon favorably, so it didn't really get talked about. In fact, I knew something was going on, but until I listened to the tape, I didn't know exactly what it was. We all just assumed she was a little off. Off? I asked her. Yes, off. Mental problems. My great-grandmother supposedly had this gift, too, and was killed in a mysterious hunting accident by her husband. She grew up with stories about Annie Oakley and would often accompany him on hunting trips. The whole family thought it was suspicious, but nothing ever came of it. Years later, on his deathbed, he confessed to killing her on purpose. He said an angel appeared to him one night, and he immediately felt at peace. The angel told him God wanted him to kill his wife because of her evil premonitions. When the will was read, we learned that he took all the women out of the will because they were possessed by evil. I think this is why why my mother was shunned when she showed signs of having the gift. She paused for a few minutes and then... I think my sister had this gift as well. I asked her why she thought that. Well, I'm not positive about it, but after what she did, the things in the basement, she definitely wasn't right in the head. When I asked about the things in the basement, she told me that even after all these years, she can't bring herself to talk about it. Now, I probably shouldn't have, but I pushed her and I guess I went a little too far because she ended the phone call. Now, we don't know what happened in the basement, but we did get most of our other questions answered. The question that we still need to answer is who ripped up the letter and who stole it from the box? Are they the same person? Why did they do it? You know, I'm not sure we'll ever know for sure who ripped the letter. But I do know that there are several of these, um, I don't know what you'd call them, uh, people, ghosts, supernatural entities involved in this whole thing. I've been contacted by at least two of them, and Sutton may have had contact with a third who could be responsible for ripping the letter among other things that happened to her inside that house. Um, As for the why, I think Patricia's letter is a clear warning to stay away. And whoever is responsible for these acts wants us to do the exact opposite, right? They want us to listen to the tapes. They want us to go discover something that they want the world to see. When I went to retrieve the tapes, Patricia's letter was replaced by one personally addressed to me. Now, this letter both warns and encourages the investigation. It's like he wants me to do this investigation, but wants me to understand what I'm getting myself into. Now, this letter is five pages long, written in Old English on old paper, and is signed by a Snor Helig. Now, we did a little research on this name. It's a 10th century name that means Snor the Holy One. My linguistic es- expert places his accent around the same time, the 10th century. He speaks in what appears to be Old Norse, Old Swedish, Old Icelandic, somewhere, you know, up in the the, the Old Scandinavian region. Now, before I read this letter from Snor, I should mention that right before I left to go get the tapes, this message was left on my hotline. Did our Snor Helige some tal on my day? Vared. Okay, so that translates to, it's me, Snorheleg, that speaks to you. You should fear the darkness. Now, you could look at these words as a warning, but I think it's a preface to his letter, which says, and you can stop the podcast and download a copy at awalkindarkness.com if you want, and read along. A warning for you, Mr. Fitch. I've been watching you. I know your quest to always find the truth, but when you open your mind and see things of nightmares, the things contained in this box is what you will find. Pay the utmost attention to my next words, Mr. Fitch. If you choose to pursue your investigation, you will not be able to stop the evil that seeps into every crack of every person's thoughts. I'm drowning in the hope that all is not lost because you, Mr. Fitch, have the ability to outsmart it. There is always a beginning, a middle, and an end to every story. And history is these stories repeating themselves over and over because there is one simple rule that must never be broken. There is a powerful force that wishes to see this rule broken, which will end the repetitive cycle and bring a new power. If you abandon this investigation, you will take a similar, 
you will be similar to those who came before you. That I can promise you. But as you've been warned previously, only you can choose which role you play in history. What I'm about to share with you in the following pages I share with you as a friend. While I know the history you are about to read will be difficult to believe, I assure you these words speak the truth. Use these words wisely, Mr. Fitch, and do not waste time. The Story of Good versus Evil The Beginning Starting as an idea, a collection of thoughts pulled together, then particles twisting and forming, he was created by God. He was named Elec. He did not have a childhood to outgrow, no awkward phases to work through. He was made perfect. His job started the day he came to being, with the training ground heaven and the archangels to oversee him. Elec had responsibles. He was the messenger, a go-between, if you will, between the humans in his care and God. He was also in charge of overseeing the care of their souls, to guide them from first breath to last. Elec was a guardian angel. As an angel, Elec fell into a long line of rules and restrictions. He never questioned his duty and did what was expected of him. He was young. The souls he guided from birth to death gave him a feeling of satisfaction and completeness. If you could peek in on heaven, you would see for all its infinite time and space and order, all angels like humans are created with free will, which left unchecked has and will create chaos. There are nine angelic orders watching over the human race, each with a role to play and broken into three triads. The highest order of God's angelic servants are seraphim angels, which are angels of love, light, and fire. Cherubim angels and thrones also make up this first triad. Down in the third triad, you find the archangels. They are the divine messengers between humans and God and are the warriors. Being in one of the lowest realm of angels is Elec, a guardian angel. They are very close to humans. Our thoughts, feelings, and desires become a skin on these angels. I really feel quite sorry for them living in heaven and hell all at the same time. The Middle Let's go back to chaos. A long time ago, chaos trampled through heaven. Lucifer, who was one of the closest to God, believed that free will wasn't free will if it came with restrictions and limitations. These thoughts caused him to be on the opposite side of his maker. This soon-to-be-fallen angel gathered soldiers and fought against the ones he had once stood behind. A war broke out in heaven. Michael, an archangel, was given the task to lead God's army against Lucifer. The archangels raised their weapons and charged into combat with God on their lips. When all was done, Lucifer was tossed down to hell along with his followers. Some say up to one-third of the angels in heaven tumbled down with him. I have no hard numbers to say which is true or which is false. The fallen angels brought the purest form of free will to humankind, or what we've come to know as sins. While all angels, demonic or heavenly, are prevented from interfering with free will, they can and often present you with choices. Religion has told us that evil is responsible for the pain, despair, lies, destruction, and death to humankind. It is demons who pounce and torture man. That truth is a lie, as evil exists in both heaven and hell, because the universe is about balance, the right number of souls in three realms of existence, heaven, hell, and purgatory. The one rule to which both heaven and hell would abide was created to avoid upsetting this balance. Our souls are food for heaven and hell, both places swelling and pulsating with tails, and with every step we take, we come closer to spending eternity in one place or the other. The middle continued. Elec's time. Elec had lived countless lives. He heard, watched, and followed his chargers. But he lived alongside each. He found a piece of his angelic obligations breaking free. He kept these blasphemous thoughts buried deep inside, refusing to give them a voice in his head. And as a guardian angel, he was not created for battle. But time had evolved him. His desires were chained up by rules thought up long before he came about. His first encounter with Serath, a demon, came about with a soul in peril that Elec was charged with. He introduced himself and proceeded to flaunt his deceitful ways. The demon was fearless and lasting. Angel and demon, good and evil, a game for the soul. This was their beginning. 
They play tug of war over the human in despair who felt the feud building in the air around her. She suffered. Alec embraced the bubbling anger crawling through him as he stumbled outside the rules with such ease it shook him to his core. Alec raised his sword for the first time. The weight of the item was foreign to his hand. The crashing of the blades thundered with anger. Wounds exploded over both. Physically, they were evenly matched. Mentally, Alec was weaker. He was fighting a physical war with an enemy and an emotional war with himself. He was absorbed by the hate he felt for Serath. This here is where he should have known how wrong he was. You see it, don't you? It's so clear, and yet this perfect angel chose to ignore his reason for being and followed a path to become something he was never meant to be. The archangels descended. They would always be there to stop him. They were the fighters, the only mission God had created them for. Nothing would come out of this explosion of hate Alec was clinging to. Alec lost the fight for that soul, but I'm sure this comes as no surprise. An angel filled with wrath cannot be expected to win. This wasn't the one and only soul he would lose. Serath and Alec were now bounded within the walls of their own making. The End There's only one story, it just keeps getting rewritten, the tale between good and evil. You see, bad things happen to good people every day. The power is something you cannot fathom. But what makes the story infinite is what each of us does when we are held in the palm of good versus evil. Sitting there powerless, do we choose to fight or do we choose to give in? Will you, Mr. Fitch, fight or give in? Chills run deep through me with the weight of your thoughts and questions. Will you learn from these pages and understand the truth you seek has consequences? Of course, free will means you must live your story the way that only you can. I have started you on your journey, and now you must continue on alone. I urge you to choose wisely. Signed, Snorhelig. It's a classic tale of good versus evil, a story rooted from the Christian Bible that most believe to be the word of God. To believe the contents in this letter would mean admitting its author has an inside knowledge of angels and demons that go way beyond what any mortal would have. Now, this letter, when I read it, it jolted me to the core for two reasons. First, it mentions a demon named Serath, and this is the demon who supposedly wrote the book that we're looking for. Second, the letter also confirms that at least some of the Christian beliefs are true. Angels and demons exist. God exists. Satan exists. But it also implies that the concept of good and evil that we're familiar with may not be what we think it is. If the universe needs a balance of good and evil souls, what does that mean for humanity? Will Surath's book somehow upset this balance? And those are questions that we hope to answer as we move forward in this investigation. But for now, it's time to say goodnight, and I'll give you some time to ponder what I've just shared with you. And next week, we're going to dive into the last words of Agatha O'Toole. Wally Fitch out. The Walk in Darkness podcast is produced by Booze Hound Entertainment and is written by Kate Boyer and Phil Boyer. Wally Fitch is played by Phil Boyer. Sutton Black Hill is played by Kate Boyer. Crossroads, our theme music was written and recorded by Grand Reserva. If you like this show, please visit thewalkindarkness.com and contribute to the investigation and buy exclusive merch. Thanks for listening. <laughs>